Have you ever felt hidden, smothered by what I'll call the uns, unseen, unappreciated, underestimated? Has it ever seemed like something or someone pressed the pause button on your potential and dreams? Jesus understands what it's like to be hidden. His first 30 years were mostly undocumented and uncelebrated. But with His life and ours, we dare not mistake unseen for unimportant or unapplauded for unproductive. Join me as we discover the strength God grows in Anonymous Seasons. When she was very little, my baby girl would do some extraordinary feat, like twirling around or jumping up and down. Then she'd turn toward us and pause with anticipation. If somehow we missed the, this is the end of the program cue, she'd prompt us and say, you can clap now, which of course we all did with enthusiasm. Our hearts break, don't they, when we see children who seem to have no one to clap for them. We know that a child's emotional well-being is greatly affected by the presence or absence of healthy affirmation. When that's lacking, children can grow up and spend decades unconsciously searching for that well done they never heard from someone in authority. But even with parental affirmation or several good counseling sessions, many of us still feel like children wandering around waiting for someone somewhere to start clapping. What do you wish others would clap about? What could someone affirm in you that would lead you to take a deep breath and say, finally, I've been waiting to hear that for a long, long time. Your brains or your beauty? What are you? Like 25? You never seem to age. How I wish I had your mind. You are brilliant. Or maybe your work ethic or accomplishments. Hands down, you're the hardest worker I know. What you've done here is nothing short of amazing. Or perhaps your example or sacrifice. You're such a model to me of parenting, of leading. They have no idea how much you've sacrificed to help them. What do you wish someone would clap for you about? That natural desire we all have for affirmation isn't evil. But in a fallen world, the enemy sure can twist it and use it to his advantage. Today we're going to study the second layer of Jesus' temptation in the Judean wilderness, a layer in which Jesus was tempted in the area of applause. As we've studied in past episodes, Jesus experienced three layers of temptation in the wilderness as he emerged from his hidden years. In one way or another, they're the same layers we face in our hidden and visible day-to-day -day lives. In layer one of the temptation, Satan dangled before Jesus a lure of immediate gratification in his effort to tempt Jesus in the area of appetite after Satan's first failed effort, he decided to switch bait in layer two of the temptation. Jesus had refused to perform a miracle to satisfy his own appetite, but perhaps the enemy wondered if Jesus would be willing to stage a miracle to meet the spiritual expectations of others. Let's consider Matthew 4, 5 through 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. The scenery changed drastically as Satan took Jesus out of the empty, unwanted wilderness and into the populous, fought-for city of Jerusalem. There, away from the lonely desert and on top of the lauded temple, Jesus again heard Satan's voice. 
no doubt there were other famous cities that boasted tall buildings, but Jerusalem and the temple represented the very heart and hope of the Jewish faith. Jesus' first visit to this sacred place occurred when he was only 40 days old. Thereafter, his family journeyed to Jerusalem annually for the feast of the Passover. As a child, Jesus referred to the temple as his father's house. And as a man, he wept over the city of Jerusalem. Satan took Jesus to a city that had seen him committed to God through consecration as an infant and would see him sentenced to death by crucifixion as an adult. Satan took Jesus to the temple in the shadow of which Jesus had been praised as the Messiah by a prophetess and would later be accused of blasphemy by a priest. For Jesus, the spiritual significance of the temple in Jerusalem was weighty beyond words. Personally, it was a spiritual home for him. Socially, it was the focal point of his culture's faith, representing the presence and protection of God. Politically, it was a potent religious symbol, carefully monitored by the Roman government oppressing his nation. Physically, it was where the people looked for him as God's promised Messiah to cast off Roman rule and establish his reign. As Jesus stood on the tip of the temple, the crowds below were visible, but their faces weren't individually distinguishable. Matthew records that Jesus stood at the highest point or pinnacle of the temple. The Greek word Matthew used means a little wing, which traditionally has been associated with the southeastern corner of the temple roof, a 107 meter drop to the Kidron Valley below. Another possibility is the southwestern corner, which is called the place of trumpeting. The shofar was blown on this corner to draw people's attention to important announcements or to usher in the Sabbath. From either corner at that height, Leaping off the roof would have been suicide, but leaping off the roof and being rescued by angels, now that would be spectacular. On the temple's tip, Satan dangled before Jesus a second enticing lure, mankind's attention and awe. He whispered, imagine what you could accomplish if you were viewed and pursued as spectacular. After 30 years of living in anonymity, attention alone would be tempting enough for most of us. But for Jesus, mankind's awe could have actually been useful because the people Jesus had come to save were expecting God's Messiah to make a rather grand entrance at that very spot. Consider the following observations from Matthew Henry's commentary. How subtle the devil was in the choice of the place for his temptations, intending to solicit Christ to an ostentation of his own power and a vainglorious presumption upon God's providence. He fixes him on a public place in Jerusalem, a populous city, and the joy of the whole earth. In the temple, one of the wonders of the world, continually gazed upon with admiration by someone or another. There, he might make himself remarkable and be taken notice of by everybody and prove himself the Son of God, not as he was urged in the former temptation in the obscurities of the wilderness, but before multitudes upon the most eminent stage of action. Because Jesus was the promised Messiah, this layer of temptation was infinitely more complex for him than it could ever be for us. But the lure Satan dangled before Jesus is still attractive to our human hearts because we all have a natural longing for acceptance and applause. We long to be wanted, to belong, to have our value, giftings, and contributions acknowledged and even affirmed. A dear friend of mine, Sarah Herman Malcolm, observed that one of man's fundamental desires is to be celebrated. So true, there's something about being celebrated that satisfies a deep longing in our souls. Our natural desire for acceptance predates the fall of man. Humankind has never known existence outside of the context of relationship. In the very beginning, we were designed by God to desire acceptance and affirmation ultimately from Him and also from each other. 
The longing for affirmation isn't sinful, but living for that longing, let alone making an idol of that longing, is short-sighted. The satisfaction man's approval produces is always temporary. Mankind's acceptance and applause is kind of like rain where I live. We appreciate it when it comes, we yearn for it when it's gone, and we have precious little control over its coming or going. Human favor is fickle and fleeting. Though Jesus never lived for it, let alone idolized this longing, as a man, he probably enjoyed hearing his parents well done as much as any son or daughter would. Yet Jesus was able to distinguish between what was natural and what was eternally needful. Desiring mankind's affirmation was natural, but seeking God's affirmation was needful. We'll continue our study of the second layer of the temptation in just a few minutes. Most people know me because of blindness. And I have learned over the years through God's grace to receive it as something that He's allowed for a deeper purpose that I'm always discovering. And that, my friends, is a taste. My name is Jennifer Rothschild. I am an author and a speaker. When I was 15 years old, I lost the majority of my eyesight to a disease called retinitis pigmentosa. And the day that we came home from the hospital, after I had just gotten this diagnosis of legal blindness and this prognosis of total blindness, it was silent on this car ride home. My folks didn't say anything, I didn't say anything. I think we were just so, so shocked and processing it on so many levels. We walked in and I went straight to our piano. I could not see the sheet music any longer. But I began to play a song I'd never played before. And it was as if God, I believe, had allowed a door to close at that eye hospital that day, but had opened another door right there on that piano, <laughs> allowed me to play by ear. And that day, I played that old hymn, that beloved hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And it's truly become such a picture of what God in, has done in my life through ministry. Anonymous has affirmed for me that it's okay to be in a season when you feel like you're hidden or overlooked or anonymous. Even if no one else is celebrating you, that those seasons still have purpose. And so instead of resisting those seasons as if something's wrong, to receive those seasons, to receive those circumstances, because God may be using that for His purposes. And it's, it's during those times that you're more equipped for the times when you're more visible. In ministry, my opportunities were growing and my audience size was growing. I got to a point where I resented that perhaps um, some of what God had equipped me with, maybe in my teaching or in insights, was being overlooked because I had been reduced to a story of blindness. And it was more the mystery of blindness or isn't that amazing because she's blind, when I felt like God had hidden within me much more than just a story of blindness. And the Lord taught me in anonymous seasons that receiving the story that he's given me gives me an opportunity then to steward that story. He's given each of us a story, even if it's a hard one, even if it's something that we think may even obscure um, what we would like for people to know about us. God can use that story to give us a platform to become a megaphone. He allows that story to become the voice that allows um, what He wants to be said, to be heard. In anonymous seasons, you learn if no one is watching, God sees you. And if thousands are looking at you, you still only have an audience of one.
Have you ever felt hidden or overlooked? Your potential unseen? And your abilities unappreciated? Jesus knew that season well. The first three decades of his life were unrecognized by the public eye and uncelebrated by those who knew him best. In Dr. Alicia Sholey's book, Anonymous, you will discover how to overcome the temptation that tries to steal your destiny. Embrace the beauty of hidden seasons and live a life of power and purpose. Today, for your gift of $40 or more to the many outreaches of TBN, you will receive the book, Anonymous, and the companion study guide so you can discover, as so many others have, that hidden from the eyes and accolades of man is where God does some of his greatest work. Go online or call now. Here in the second layer of the temptation, Jesus heard Satan's voice again on the tip of the temple. As recorded in Matthew 4, 6, if you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. In this exchange, Satan quoted from the middle of a section of Psalm 91 that begins in verse nine with, if you make the most high your dwelling place and ends in verse 13 with, you will tread upon the lion and the cobra. Not surprisingly, the enemy left out those bookends and instead emphasized God's promise of protection without its preceding conditions or its intended outcome. In hindsight, Psalm 91 may not have been the most strategic passage to cite because the premise of Psalm 91 is that God protects those who hide themselves in Him, not who attempt to leap off buildings in a single bound. Consider Psalm 91, one through four. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. These are some of the most beautiful images in scripture of being hidden in God. Yet being hidden was the antithesis of what Satan was tempting Jesus to do. Instead, Satan was inviting Jesus to use privilege and performance to win the public approval of man. In other words, he was tempting Jesus to become a spectacle for a good cause, of course, stage something superhuman, to draw people's attention to yourself and your message. The enemy's temptations often muddy our noble intentions with his ignoble methods. For Jesus, man's attention and awe could have served a valid purpose. Would a miraculous introduction from the temple have hastened people's acceptance of Jesus as Messiah? Probably. Could widespread public admiration have created an environment more receptive to his teachings? Most likely. So, would temporarily aligning himself with the people's expectations of what the Messiah would be and how the Messiah would act have facilitated the fulfillment of Jesus' ultimate mission more effectively? In a word, no. This is a critical point. Spiritually, ends don't justify means. In fact, self-serving means and methods have a way of mutating beyond recognition, even the most selfless of original intentions. Even if someone begins with a benevolent vision, like a business plan that could really make a difference for those in need, if they lose their moral compass along the way, they compromise the heart that birthed the dream and ultimately, the dream itself. Just like in layer one, the enemy's strategy for temptation in layer two was consistent. He dangled a lure that appealed to a longing, then he identified the means, the how, and ultimately issued a bold invitation to sin. However, Jesus' strategy for resisting temptation was equally consistent and far more powerful. 
Thankfully, Jesus didn't lose his spiritual equilibrium for even a moment because he was anchored firmly in the Word of God. In Matthew 4, 7, we read, Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Once again, Jesus quoted one sentence in the book of Deuteronomy and in doing so strengthened himself with the whole story. He cited Deuteronomy 6.16, which reads, Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massah. These words were spoken by Moses to the Israelites toward the end of their desert experience as they were about to enter the Promised Land. Massah wasn't immediately meaningful to me, so I had to do some research. But its mention might have caused the Israelites a wee bit of discomfort Around three months after God had worked signs and wonders of deliverance in Egypt, the Israelites camped at a waterless place called Rephidim, somewhere in the desert north or northwest of Mount Sinai. There we read in Exodus 17, 2 through 3 and 7, that they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? God had delivered the Israelites from Egypt with multiple miracles that continued into their desert wanderings. At Mara, they saw bitter waters become sweet. In the desert of Sin, they dined on quail and saw manna fall from heaven. But miraculous signs evidently don't guarantee contentment in our circumstances or confidence in God's future provision. By citing this passage from Deuteronomy, Jesus linked what Satan was inviting him to do on the temple with what the Israelites had chosen to do at Massah. Satan's challenge for Jesus to throw himself off the temple with the expectation that God would send angels to catch him was the equivalent of saying, is the Lord among us or not? Jesus would have been forcing Father God's hand to prove his sonship in rather spectacular fashion in the sight of all the people. Well, God's people had tested him at Massah back then, but God's son wouldn't test him in Jerusalem now. Jesus resisted Satan's temptation by choosing to honor God's ways and not live for man's awe. That anchor forged in Jesus' hidden years held strong in the desert and throughout his public years. This wouldn't be the only time Jesus was challenged to use privilege and performance to win approval. In Matthew 12, 38 through 39, we read, Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign. And then again at the crucifixion in Matthew 27, 41 through 42, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. From the tip of the temple, amidst the leaders and the crowds, and eventually on a rough, blood-stained cross, Jesus saw clearly that honoring God's ways and living for man's awe were mutually incompatible life motivations. If he had become what they wanted him to be in the moment, a political deliverer, he would have forfeited what they needed him to be for eternity, a merciful redeemer. Here are two truths I hope you can take home from today's study of Anonymous. Number one, altruistic motivations can't sanitize self-serving methodology. And number two, our need for affirmation can only be fully satisfied in God. At the beginning of this episode, I asked what you would like someone to stand and clap for you about. 
Maybe your honest answer was a contribution to the family or an accomplishment at work. Beauty, intelligence, or strength. Maybe you feel you've messed up so much that no one should ever stand and clap for you again. Well, someone is already clapping. Not because of any stunning accomplishment, but because you are His beloved creation. Mankind's affirmation can't satisfy the depths of our natural need for acceptance and affirmation. Just like a short spoon in a tall glass, people's attention simply can't reach the bottom of our profound longing to be valued. Only God can reach that place because He's the one who created that place. He created us to love us, feel it or not, through Jesus Christ, you have God's attention and acceptance, and there's nothing humankind can do or say to add to or subtract from those riches. Until next time. In a world consumed by becoming someone, going somewhere, and being known, it's time to stop, take a breath, and discover the beauty of being hidden. Through Dr. Alicia Sholey's book, Anonymous, you will discover the keys to walking in your identity, understanding your purpose, and living with intentionality. And you'll develop, as Jesus did, the strength necessary to withstand the trials and tests that so often come with the spotlight. I think that what Alicia has done with the book Anonymous and the work that she continues to do is really transforming lives. I see so many people that want to live a deep, authentic, not a striving, performance, chasing, um, hustling for love kind of life. I feel like that's where Anonymous kind of intersected my life. The book Anonymous is an unbelievable book. I mean, Alicia, great writer. She made the statement that 90% of Jesus' life was anonymous and no one knew that he existed. Reading these words, like it just leapt off the page and really transformed my life. Today, for your gift of $40 or more in support of the many outreaches of TBN, we want to send you your very own book, Anonymous, along with the companion study guide, Discover Purpose in the Hidden Seasons. Call or go online to receive yours today.